Let me ask you a question. How much different would your life be if you lived as if Jesus died yesterday, rose this morning, and is coming back tonight? Don't you think that would change a lot of things in your outlook on life? The truth of the matter is this, Jesus is coming one day soon, and it will be glory for the child of God. Hi, I'm Pastor Jeff Shreve, inviting you to join me in our study of Romans chapter eight, as we learn the truth about our future glory. In the late 80s, a man wrote a book. He was an unknown until 1988, and then people began to know who he was because he sold 4.5 million copies of this book. His name was Edward Wisenat, and the book title was 88 Reasons While the Rapture is during the Feast of Trumpets in 1988. 88 reasons why the rapture will be in 1988. And he put it in the Feast of Trumpets, September 11th through 13th. Four and a half million copies sold. Spoiler alert, Jesus didn't come in 1988, just in case you were going to get the book. He wrote a follow-up book called The Rapture Report, 1989. 89 reasons why I missed it. Uh, that was the subtitle. He thought Jesus was coming in 1989. Well, I know he's coming soon, he said. And his final book was called 23 Reasons Why a Pre-Tribulation Rapture Will Occur in 1993. Edward Wisenot. Uh, you know, Jesus didn't come in 1988, he didn't come in 1989, he didn't come in 1993. We don't know when he's coming. That's heaven's most guarded secret. We just know that he is coming, and we are not to set dates, but we are to set our hearts on the fact that his coming is soon. It says in the book of James, the coming of the Lord is at hand, and we don't know when. Jesus said, an hour when you think not, the Son of Man comes. So we need to live every day. Here's a great way to live. Live as if Jesus died yesterday, rose this morning, and is coming back tonight. That, that's how you keep the death, burial, resurrection, and return of Christ near and dear to your heart. That keeps you excited in the Lord to live for Him every second of every day. Well, today we want to talk, as we're going through Romans chapter 8, we want to talk about future glory because that's what the Scripture deals with in, uh, in today's passage, verses 18 through 27. It talks about future glory. And Titus chapter 2 tells us we're to live godly in this present evil age, and we're looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is coming one day. We don't know when. We just know that He is, and we're excited about that future glory. Do you have the anticipation in your heart for the coming of the Lord? Are you longing, big question, for the return of Christ and coming glory? Well, this is what Paul says, beginning in verse 16. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our, with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, or since children, heirs, also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him, in order that we may also be glorified with Him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. Now, the passage we're going to study today 
It talks about three witnesses, three witnesses who are longing for the return of Christ. Actually, it uses the word groaning. To, to, it means to sigh. It means to murmur. And the, and the three witnesses, they long so much that they groan within themselves at the return of Christ because at the return of Christ, the Christian is glorified. So the question, are you longing for the return of Jesus Christ and for his coming glory? Because Jesus himself said in Matthew 25, when the Son of Man comes, he comes with power and great glory. So let's look at the first witness. The first witness that groans uh, longing for the return of Christ is creation. The creation is groaning for his return. So it said in verse 19 that the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. Uh, that literally means creation waits eagerly, waits on tiptoes, so to speak. It's so excited about the coming of the Lord and the revealing of the sons of God because that happens at the coming of the Lord. It says in verse 20, for the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Now, why is creation so uh, thrilled and excited and longing and groaning for the revealing of the sons of God, for the coming of the Lord? Well, it's for two reasons. Number one, when Adam fell, the creation was cursed. You know, people talk about this world, and they, they love to say, well, you know, I can't believe in God because there's so much pain, there's so much suffering. If, there's, if God is so good, then why did he make this world uh, so diseased and, and ridden with curses and problems and death and disease, all that stuff? Well, he didn't make it like that. He made it perfect. And it was good, and it was good, and it was good, and it was good all the days of creation. And then the sixth day when he makes Eve, it was very good. Everything is good in Genesis chapter 2 at the end of day 6 and the seventh day God rested and he looked at it all that he's made and it is good and all of the animal kingdom good all of nature is good but then in Genesis 3 Adam and Eve fell they sinned against God they had one commandment and they blew it and when they fell and the Lord deals with their fall well what happens the serpent is cursed, cursed more than any beast of the field is the serpent. But with this curse on the serpent, there's also a curse on all the animal kingdom. And then the Lord says to Adam, because you have done this, you've listened to the voice of your wife, cursed is the ground because of you. And so all the, the ground that yields up vegetables and that yields up uh, fruit, that's all cursed. Everything in creation is cursed. And creation mirrors what happened to man. Man started out perfect. Creation was perfect. Man fell. God put creation under a curse. And what does it have now? It's subjected to futility. It produces thorns and thistles. You know, the animal kingdom went from friendly to fierce, and the ground went from fruitful to barren. Thorns and thistles it will produce. It, it, it says that it is subjected to futility. That literally means disappointing misery. That's what creation is under, disappointing misery. That kind of describes my golf game. Disappointing misery is, is uh, most of the time. And uh, so th that's what creation feels. And so they want to be set free. Creation itself wants to be set free from that. And when Jesus returns in his glory and the sons of God are revealed in glory, then creation will be set free. The millennial kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, the thousand-year reign of Jesus on the earth, it will be like the Garden of Eden again, this planet like the Garden of Eden. What was the Garden of Eden like in terms of animals? You didn't need to be afraid of animals. Uh, what was it like in terms of farming? You know, Adam had a job. He was a farmer. 
How did he farm? He just tickled the soil. That's all you do. And it just grows like crazy. There are no weeds. There are no thorns. There are no thistles. And the, the ground is just free to bloom and blossom. Now, Isaiah 35, this is what it says in the, uh, in the God's, God's Word version. The desert and the dry land, talking about the millennial kingdom, the desert and the dry land will be glad and the wilderness will rejoice and blossom. Like a lily, the land will blossom. It will rejoice and sing for joy, with joy. It will have the glory of Lebanon, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. Everyone will see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. We go to the desert. That's like going outside these days. It, it just feels like the desert, right? Well, you, you go to the desert. You go to Australia in the outback. Uh, it can be, you know, 125, 130 degrees. Well, one day the desert is going to bloom like a rose. It's going to be like flowers everywhere. The, the earth is going to be released from the curse. And in the animal kingdom, animals will go from fierce to friendly once again. This is what is going to happen in the created world, in the, the animal kingdom during the millennial kingdom, Isaiah chapter 11, and the wolf will dwell with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the kid, and the calf and young lion and fatling together, and a little boy will lead them. How cool is that? You're a little guy, you think, hey, in the millennial kingdom, you get to play with lions, and you can lead them around. Also, the cow and the bear will graze. Their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox, and the nursing child will play by the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child will put his hand on the viper's den, and they will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as waters cover the sea." And see, creation can't wait to be set free from disappointing misery, from the futility, from the slavery and the bondage that it feels. It doesn't want to have a dog-eat-dog -dog system in nature. It was subjected to that because the Lord has nature and the created world mirror what's happening in man. Man fell. Nature is under the curse of the fall. When man is glorified... Uh, in Jesus Christ, then creation will be set free. So the creation is groaning for his return. Second witness, you have the Christian, and the Christian is groaning and longing for his return. He says in verse 23, and not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of the body. Now, he's already talked about us being adopted into the family of God, and that has taken place. But it hasn't taken place to the fullest extent because the ultimate final adoption as sons is the redemption of our body. For in hope we have been saved but hope that is not seen is not hope, for why does one also hope for what he sees? But if we hope for that which we do not see with perseverance, we wait eagerly for it. You say, what does that mean? Well, hope in the Bible is confident expectation. Uh, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters inside the veil, that veil that separates, that heavy veil of the temple that would separate the people from God. So hope is confident expectation that what the Lord has promised, He is going to fulfill. And we have the first fruits of the Spirit. The Bible says that we're sealed in Him with the Holy Spirit of promise, Ephesians 1.13. And that uses the word erebon, which means... Uh, engagement ring, down payment, earnest money. And the Lord is saying, see, you can know for certain that I am going to ultimately redeem you because I've given you my spirit, and you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Remember we talked about the three tenses of salvation? We have past tense, which is justification. Romans 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free, set you free from the law of sin 
and of death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. And so that is justification. We put our faith and trust in Jesus. We give our life to him. He gives his life to us. He comes to live inside of us through the person of the Holy Spirit. God wraps his gavel, says not guilty. That is past tense salvation. Now, present tense salvation is the Lord who comes into your life, the Holy Spirit of God, he's working on you. He's sanctifying you. He's chipping away at you. As it says in verse uh, 13, for if you're living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you're putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. That's how the Spirit works on us. He puts to death the deeds of the body. He helps us to grow, to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But then there is this ultimate redemption, ultimate salvation, this future tense of salvation, and that is glorification. We are Christians, those of us who know Christ, we're Christians. We have the Holy Spirit living inside of us, but we're encased in flesh, sinful flesh. And the flesh wars against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, Galatians chapter 5. And so we have this battle going on inside. And Paul said this in, in Romans chapter 7. He said, the good that I long to do, I don't do. And the evil that I don't want to do, I do. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? Now, can you say amen to Paul? Do you ever say, I want to do right, but I find myself doing wrong? And the good that I do, I don't do. But the evil that I don't want to do, I do. That's the truth for every Christian. If you're truly a Christian, you don't want to disobey the Lord. You want to obey Him because you love Him. But there's this battle that takes place. Well, one day when the Lord comes back, we will be glorified. We will say goodbye to this body of sin this flesh that is at war with God, and we'll get a brand new body just like the Lord Jesus Christ. So when Christ returns, we will be glorified. This is what Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 20. For our citizenship is in heaven. Hey, the moment you trust Christ, then the Lord writes your name down in the Lamb's book of life. And your citizenship is secure in heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of His glory by the exertion of the power that He has even to subject all things to Himself. We're waiting for Him to come. We're excited about Him coming. John says this in 1 John chapter 3, see how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God, and such we are. For this reason the world does not know us because it did not know Him. Now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we shall be. But we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him just as he is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. Hey, one day when we see the Lord, we're going to be made like him. And we're not going to have a body of sin anymore in everything in our lives. We are now saved completely. Justification, sanctification, and glorification. We're made like Christ. That's exciting. And that is to come. And we have that, that hope. Now, we haven't seen it yet. But it's a hope. It's confident expectation. The Bible doesn't ever use hope like we use hope. Well, I hope we get some cold or, or you know, cooler weather this week. I, I hope this happens. Well, you're just wishing for that, you know. I hope I play better the next time I go out and play golf. You're just big time wishing for that, right? Uh, you're just making it up in your head, you know. I hope this. Well, that's not how it is in the Bible. It's a confident expectation. This hope we have is an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters into the veil. So we will be glorified. Now, the longer we live on this earth, and the more we grow in the Christian life, the more we groan for glorification. That's the, that's the desire of a Christian, the more we grow. Now, think about it, just the longer you live. You know, when you're, when you're in your 20s, teenager, you're in your 20s, 
uh, even up, you know, in mid-30s, then you're, you're prime time physically. And uh, you can feel like you can do anything. I mean, you know, you, your athletes are, they're, they're the, the peak in their 20s. They don't have pains like the rest of us. <laughs> but you start living for a while. I mean, everything hurts. And what doesn't hurt doesn't work anymore. That's, that's what it's like to get old. I mean, it's just tough. I like what one guy said about getting old because everything starts to groan. And Paul used that in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He said, in this earthly tent, we groan because we're getting older and our bodies are decaying. Interestingly, when um, the Lord told Adam... Uh, from the, any tree of the garden you may freely eat, but from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat from it. For in the day you eat of it, you will surely die. Literally in Hebrew, dying you'll die. Because we know Adam and Eve ate of the fruit, and they didn't just drop dead, but they did die. They died instantly in their spirit, in that place that knew God. They died progressively in their soul, their mind, will, and emotions, and they became bent toward evil, and they died ultimately in their body. Adam died when he was 930 years old. And so your body is just constantly decaying, like the little boy, four years old, had a sunburn and was peeling. He said, I'm only four years old. I'm already coming apart. That's what happens to us. We, we just start coming apart. And the longer you live, the more you will decay. That just happens. I like what one guy said. He said, first you forget names, then you forget faces, then you forget to pull up your zipper, <laughs> then you forget to pull down your zipper. I mean, it just <laughs> goes from bad to worse, right, as you get older. It's just the way it is. So we, we groan, longing. My mother is probably watching, and she's getting ready to be 95 years old, and, and uh, she's got such a great attitude, but she's in a wheelchair, and she said, you know, I can't walk, and I can't see much anymore, and I really can't hear, but other than that, I'm doing great. And so, <laughs> you know, it's one of those things. She's longing to be set free from this body. So we groan the longer we live, but we also groan the more we grow spiritually. Why? Because we know that we want to please God, we want to honor God, but we're still dealing with selfishness, we're still dealing with jealousy, we're still dealing with pride, we're still dealing with greed and with lust and with insecurities. Those things, they haven't gone away. Now, hopefully, we are rising above those things and defeating those things. Uh, verse 13, if you're living according to the flesh, you must die, but if by the Spirit you're putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And so we're constantly having to put to death the deeds of the body because they're still there and they're still pulling at us. They're rendered powerless. We don't have to listen to the flesh anymore, but it is still there. And so the more you grow, the more you long to be set free so that you can serve God 24-7 and please Him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of Him, strengthened with all power according to His glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience, joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. And we, we just long for that the more we grow in the Lord. So we groan because we want to be set free from the body of this death. And then the more we consider, the more we rejoice in suffering. As you set your mind on the glory that shall be revealed to us, that's why he says in verse 18, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed to us. It's not even worthy, the sufferings that you're going through, whatever those sufferings are. You know, you talk to some people who have legitimate issues in their life. And it's such a contrast because you have Christians that endure suffering through the power of the Holy Spirit, and they, they just kind of minimize those, and they say, oh, it's not so bad. You know, it's, it's like my mom, you know, I, I can't walk, can't hear, can't, can't see, but overall I'm doing great, and she has a good spirit about it. And then you have other Christians that are, woe is me. They just moan and groan and grind, uh, uh, not in a good way, the groaning. 
It's, it's kind of like the children of Israel, that, that kind of moaning and murmuring. Uh, there's no water. What are we going to do? We don't have any water. Oh, oh, all we have to eat is this manna. I'm so sick of this manna. And they're always grumbling and griping and complaining. We're not to be like that. And, and the sufferings of this present time, no matter how bad your sufferings, Paul had a lot of sufferings. He called them momentary light affliction. Momentary light affliction is producing for me, he said, an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. So when he really thought about it, for I consider, that means to esteem, to think on, to reckon, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time, no matter how bad they might be, it's not even worthy to be compared to what God has in store for us. As it said about creation, uh, it, 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 creation is groaning like a woman giving birth, getting ready to give birth. I remember when Debbie uh, was, was in the hospital with uh, getting ready to give birth to Jill, our first daughter, and she went through labor. It seemed like about 24 hours. It was a long time. What was it? Forever. Oh, forever. She said forever. She's, she's still in labor and uh, she hides it well. It was, I, think it was, I think it was 24 hours or 30 minutes, something like that. Anyway, it was, it, no, it, was, it was long, and it was very painful, and it wasn't working. And she was groaning when those, those uh, contractions would come. And, oh, there was so much pain. Well, when the baby comes, that pain is washed away. And it is just overwhelmed by the fact that you have this beautiful child now in your arms that God has entrusted you with. And we were entrusted with three beautiful girls that we got to uh, train up in the, the way that they should go. And, and what a blessing. And a, and a mom remembers that childbirth hurt, but that's not even, that's not worthy to be compared with, with what she has in that little child. Well, that's the way it is for us. And the more we consider the more we're able to rejoice in sufferings. Hey, here's the problem that we have. The sufferings are real, and we know what that's like. And we know about the hardships and difficulties and pain, and physical pain is, is hard. I'm not trying to minimize that. If you're in physical pain, I realize that can make us very short-tempered and uh, irritable because we hurt. But you can have emotional pain. Chris has shared with me before, uh, between physical pain and emotional pain, he's had both. He said, physical pain is easier to deal with than emotional pain. But pain is pain. And so we have this pain that we're very uh, well aware of because it's in our lives. When we think about future glory, we have a harder time understanding what that is. Because God doesn't tell us everything about what life is going to be like during the millennial kingdom. He doesn't, have, he doesn't tell us everything about uh, our glorious body. It's going to be a body like Jesus uh, in terms of glory. He doesn't tell us everything about heaven. He tells us enough for us. There are no more uh, mourning, no more crying, no more pain, no more death. All the no mores that you read about in Revelation chapter 21. He tells us about that. But, but it's, it's, it's kind of an unknown for us. The Bible says what eye has not seen nor ear heard nor has even entered into the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. So we have a tendency to magnify our problems here on the earth and we minimize the glory that is to come. And what we need to do is the opposite. We need to say, hey, this problem that I have, it's momentary light affliction because I'm going to experience the glory of God forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Hey, that is worth a ton. So 24 hours of labor, as hard as that is, pales in comparison to a full life of your child. Hey, Fanny Crosby, we talked about her last week, the great hymn writer. She was blinded at six weeks old. And uh, she had a pastor, a well-meaning pastor, say to her one day, I think it's a great pity, Fanny, that the master did not give you sight when he showered so many other gifts upon you. And she said to him, do you know that if at birth I had been able to make one petition of the Lord, it would have been that I would be born blind? The pastor said, well, why would that be? She, bec she said, because... When I get to heaven, the first face 
that shall ever gladden my sight will be that of my Savior. That's the right perspective is, hey, this stuff doesn't mean anything. What is coming, that is what has my heart. And the rest of this is just momentary light affliction. It's going to be over. And listen, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing his praise than when we first begun. And none of us will remember anything about the suffering here on the earth. It'll all be washed away in glory. So let's start thinking about that. Creation is groaning. The Christian is groaning for his return. And this last one is a shocker. The Holy Spirit is groaning for his return. Look what it says in verse 26. And in the same way, in the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. In the same way, that you are enduring suffering, that you are patiently enduring. Well, he says in verse 25, but if we hope for what we do not see with perseverance, we wait eagerly for it. In the same way, the Holy Spirit is there. He's waiting with us as we wait for the Lord's return, and he's groaning with us in just the same way. And, and you know, we have we have so, uh, as a society, we've so maligned the Holy Spirit. People don't understand uh, who the Holy Spirit is and what he uh, came to do, what his office work is. And we have churches that have gone hog wild on all these crazy things, and they attribute all that to the Holy Spirit. That's not biblical. Here's what the Holy Spirit does. Three things that are mentioned here. Number one, the Holy Spirit helps us to patiently endure. Just as we are... Uh, waiting with perseverance for the coming of the Lord, the Holy Spirit helps us to patiently endure. He helps us in our sufferings to endure those. Hupomone is the Greek word. It means to stay under, to remain. That's the word that's translated perseverance. And you know, the Holy Spirit, Jesus called him the helper, the helper, the paraclete. A paraclete is one called alongside to render aid. That's the Holy Spirit. And he lives inside. And he lives inside of us to render aid, to help us, no matter what we're going through, to help us deal with it. So that the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, against such things there is no law, that those things would just be overflowing in our lives, regardless of the circumstances. That's why Paul said in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can face any difficulty in any problem through Christ who strengthens me, who lives in me by his Spirit, because the Spirit gives joy, the Spirit gives power, the Spirit gives peace unrelated to circumstances. doesn't have anything to do, well, I'll have joy if I have good circumstances. No, you have joy because you're trusting in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice, and you can rejoice in him because he never leaves you, never forsakes you, and he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So the Holy Spirit is our helper. He helps us to patiently endure. And the Holy Spirit prays for us to walk by faith. He is interceding for us. Now, it says that he helps our weakness. That is our moral frailty because we are, we have the spirit inside, but we're encased with flesh that wants to do evil. And so, the spirit helps us with our moral frailty, and he helps us to walk by faith. Now, some people have taken this verse the, the groaning's too deep for words, and they say, well, that means speaking in tongues. That's what that's talking about. It's talking about speaking in tongues. It's not talking about speaking in tongues. It's talking about intercessory prayer. Groaning's too deep for words means you don't have words. So it's not something that you're going to hear. And uh, there's nowhere in the Bible, anytime you read about speaking in tongues, tongues are known languages. You want to know about speaking in tongues? Read Acts chapter 2. That tells us the most about tongues. It's a known language. 
Tongues are for, not for believers, but for unbelievers. And the people were uh, noticing when, the, when they started to speak in tongues in Acts chapter 2, they're speaking of the mighty deeds of God in our native language. How do they know that? Tongues is not intercessory prayer. Tongues was evangelism. It was sharing and speaking the mighty deeds of God. And so this is talking about something different. The Holy Spirit inside he is praying for us. He is interceding for us because we don't know how to pray as we should. And so he's praying for us. And God the Father who searches the hearts, 1 Samuel chapter 16, the Lord doesn't see as man sees, man sees the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. God who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Now, Jesus, it says in Romans 8, 34, He's interceding for us. So you have Jesus in heaven seated at the right hand of the Father. He's praying for us. For us, He's interceding for the saints. You have the Holy Spirit inside. He's praying for us. He's interceding for us. And we have a good example of this in Luke chapter 22, where at the Last Supper, you remember Peter told Jesus, hey, everybody may desert you, but I'm not going to desert you. I'm with you. I'm ready to go to prison and to death. And Jesus said this to Simon Peter. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat, to shake you to the very core. But I have prayed for you. I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And you, when once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. The Lord prayed for him. What did he pray? That your faith wouldn't fail. And what do we know about Peter? His faith didn't fail. His faith faltered, but it didn't fail. It can't fail. Why? Because the Lord holds him, and the Lord prays for him, and the Lord intercedes for him. And we have the Holy Spirit living inside who prays for the true believers. He prays for the saints according to the will of God. He prays for us if we're true believers. Jesus is interceding for us. And, and this idea that you could lose your salvation is ludicrous. Listen, you mark it down. If you could lose your salvation because it depended on you, you would lose your salvation, and I would lose my salvation, and we would lose our salvation, and the apostle Paul would have lost his salvation. You're not kept by your strength. You're kept by his strength and by his prayers and by his power. The Bible says we're kept by the power of God, and he will not let you go. And so the Holy Spirit is praying for you and me. What is he praying? That we would patiently endure the sufferings, the difficulties, that we would have joy and peace regardless of the circumstances, that we would stay connected to Jesus and that our faith would not fail. It might get shaken as Peter's faith was shaken, but it's not going to fail. And then lastly, the Holy Spirit works in us to complete our salvation, to complete our salvation, because he's never going to let us go. We're sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who's given a pledge, uh, an Arabon, a down payment, uh, an, an engagement ring, the pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. And here's how the Holy Spirit works. So the, the Holy, when he shall come, Jesus said, he will convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. The Holy Spirit is the convictor. And every Christian has a testimony that God convicted me that I was a sinner and I was lost and I needed Jesus. In some form or fashion, it boils down to there has to be conviction from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the convictor. And then he is the converter. The moment you pray to receive Christ, you give your life to Jesus, he comes in to live inside of you through the person of his Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who makes you alive with Christ. He is the convictor. He's the converter. He's the comforter and the counselor. He's the one that works in you in this thing called sanctification. He's the one that chips away those rough spots in you to make you the person that God wants you to be. Take away the dross from the silver, and there comes out a vessel for the smith. And he's all the time scumming, uh, skimming off the dross in our lives. The convictor, the converter, the comforter, and the completer. Because one day, we're going to be made like Christ. Philippians 
1.6. For I am confident, Paul says, of this, that he who began a good work in you, who's that? The Holy Spirit. That he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. He's not going to leave you unfinished. And the moment that you're justified, you can mark it down. You will one day be glorified because it's not on you, it's on the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is going to see you to completion. That's good news. Hey, have you ever, have you ever started something that you weren't able to finish? You know, maybe as a kid, you had a model uh, airplane or something like that. You saw the picture. You know, when I was a kid, those were really big. Uh, but you would see the, the cover on the box. Oh, this looks so cool, this, this uh, airplane. I'm going to do this. And then you get into it, and it's like, oh, this, is, this is hard. I can't figure this out. This doesn't go together. This takes a lot of time. This takes a lot of glue. I thought I could do this in an hour. It's going to take me days. And so you, you get halfway done, and then you, you put it back in the box, or you smash it, and you say, I hate this, you know? Well, the Holy Spirit doesn't do that. He doesn't start something, and then he can't complete it. Years ago, I heard this joke that Adrian Rogers told about Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. It became a favorite of mine when I was in college. Little boy comes home, uh, little Billy, and he talks to his dad, and he said, Dad, I was over at Jimmy's house, and Jimmy showed me in his daddy's bedroom a list that his dad has on his nightstand, and it was a list of men that he can whip, and your name is the first name on that list. <laughs> he said, is that right? D does uh, Billy's daddy really have a list like that? He goes, yeah, I saw it. So the guy gets mad. He goes over to... Uh, to Jimmy's house, Billy, whatever the name, and he <laughs> knocks on the door, and Jimmy's daddy answers the door. And he says, yeah. He says, hey, my son Billy said that your son Jimmy said that you had a list of names of men that you could whip, and my name's the first name on that list. Is that right? He said, yeah, that's right. He said, well, you can't whip me. What are you going to do about it? He said, well, I take your name off the list. Listen, he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Once your name is on the list, and once your name is in the Lamb's book of life, he will never take your name off the list. He takes you all the way to glory. And the Spirit is praying for you, and the Lord Jesus is praying for you. And if you know Jesus, you need to get excited about future glory, because that's coming soon. As we close out today, I want to ask you, do you know for certain that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? Listen, if you're not sure about that, just pray this simple prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I can't save myself. But Jesus, I believe you're a God in the flesh. I believe you died on the cross for my sins and rose again from the dead. And right now, Jesus, I open my heart to you. Forgive me of all my sins. Come into my life. Be my Lord and Savior. I surrender my all to you. And I promise to follow you all the days of my life. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in and your life will never be the same. Hey, I'd love to hear from you, to know that you're watching, to know that God is making a difference in your life through this broadcast, to know that you just prayed that prayer. Please contact us. Let us know what's going on. We want to pray for you. We want to help you. You are important to God, and you're important to us, and we're here for you.